I'm here in the Kashmir Hills of Christchurch today speaking with Colin Monty, photographer and adventurer extraordinaire who has kindly taken time out from a trip, family trip to Mount Cook to be with us and speak with us this morning. Thanks so much Colin for taking the time out to talk to us today. Yeah, hi Lynette. It's Pleasure. lovely to oh, meet you. Mm. Um, tell us Colin, um, were you born here in Christchurch? How long have you been here? No, I was born in Scotland and um, our family emigrated to Australia when I was a young boy, so I was, went to school there and educated, Boy Scouts. Wow. And that's what I, when I got into, um, into rock climbing and eventually yes. mountaineering yes. in Australia. Wow. And I also realised that the Australians um, had a, controlled a huge amount of Antarctica, but they didn't have any mountains. And I, I looked at the, what the New Zealand program was doing, yes. based, based from Christchurch, yeah. of course, yes. and that's when I started to fall in love with Antarctica um, right then. And I realised then that um, the, the New Zealand Boy Scouts took down um, Boy Scouts to Scott Base, yes. and imp more importantly, Girl Guides. So I oh. thought, there's the place for me, New Zealand, um, inspirational. So anyway, one thing led to another, and um, I started coming to New Zealand every summer while I was at university to yes. go mountaineering at Mount Cook and, and that led on to working in Antarctica. Fabulous. So when did you actually get the photography bug? Well it was through mountaineering really at, at, in the New Zealand Alps. Um, so I was documenting the climbs obviously that I was doing and uh, and likewise when I first went to Antarctica in 1973 I couldn't afford much much film. Yes. About six rolls was my was my budget for the summer. Yeah. So uh, had to be very careful and, and of course in those days uh, working in October at Scott Bay is very cold mm. so film has its frustrations of sprockets breaking and static yes. electricity scratches across film and yes. screw mount lenses were, were dreadful on, on, uh, on cold fingers yes, um, yes. to handle. So, But anyway yes. gradually I got more and more passionate about mm. photographing both in the Antarctic and in the mountains mm. and that led on to uh, a full-time career starting in 1984. So. Yes. And true. that's how you chose landscape rather than wedding or portraiture? Well, I've, I've never really called myself a landscape photographer. Mm. Um, I suppose I, I do now that I have finally switched to digital, but um, most of my life has been documenting expeditions. Mm. Um, so I've, I've form, primarily called myself a, a photojournalist, really. Mm. And that's been my job, is, is documenting uh, climbs or journeys, travels, in the Himalayas or, or the Antarctic, yes. where I've had to not only pull my my weight as part of a team, mm -hmm. but I've also had to document it. So you end up working longer hours or working harder than wow. uh, other expedition members in some yes. respects to document those climbs. And that's how we ended up earning our living. That we would, I, but I buy a lot of books. I'm I'm addicted to buying yes. books on the countries yes. that I travel okay. into. Okay. Anyway, I was largely limited to 35 millimeter, so. Uh, in making that transition to digital four or five years ago, I've really, really enjoyed that process mm -hmm. of, um, of being in charge of creating whatever format you like, basically, by stitching images together into a full panorama mm. or creating a 5 by 4 format or a 6 by 12 format, whatever, mm. just purely by stitching. And that's been a real challenge because I'm not a very technical person. Yes. To me, photography is 90% is about passion and 10% about your technical skills. Yes. Uh, so passion and energy is what photography is all about to me. And uh, So, I, so the, the technical side of the digital world has yes. been a real struggle for me to come up to some sort of speed yes. and it's larger, largely as a result of the the two younger staff that we've employed that they've yes. dealt with a digital mm. dummy and brought yeah. me up to whatever level I'm at now. That's so right. it's, uh, it's been great fun yes. and it's been a, a huge learning curve obviously. And uh, So, uh, long story, but I've, I've changed mm. largely from being a photojournalist as I'm no longer going on, on hard expeditions yes. and I'm no longer doing much writing at, at the moment, although I plan to do some writing. But So I have enjoyed the transition to to staying at home more and photographing my own South Island yes. uh, in panorama is the obvious way to photograph the mountains or, or even farmlands or, or seascapes, whatever. The panorama is a lovely format yeah, and, or 6 by 12 sort of thing and, uh, and that's been really, really nice and I've, I've enjoyed that instead of rushing through some of these landscapes to get to the bigger mountains, mm. I've gone to the foothills and I've gone to the farmlands and I've asked farmers permission to go yes. and sleep on a, on a small hill 
on his farm somewhere and I've, and I've shown him some of these blurb books that I've done and I've said, look, this is what I want to do. And, and, the, and the essence to me is, of course, it's about light. So it's a question of being there in the evening and in the morning. So to achieve that, you have to camp there. So it's all about the view from the tent door, as I call it, and sleeping in nice places yes. to be there for uh, good light. And uh, that's been really exciting yeah. because it's not just about the photography. It's about slowing down. It's about uh, going and camping with or without a friend um, a and experience. reading a book while you're there, being quiet because I'm often on my own or with a tent buddy, whatever. Um, and it's just so great to, uh, to then take some pictures uh, yeah. if the light yeah. comes right. And uh, so that's, that's been fascinating to gradually explore my own island. And, uh, um, so could you tell us, Colin, what kind of camera you use and why? Okay, well, I'm, in the film days I was solely shooting Canon equipment and Canon lenses. Um, so when I converted to digital, I, mm. I initially I wanted to just use the same lenses, mm. although very quickly in changing to a 5D Mark I and, and now I have a F Mark II, yes. um, it very quickly highlighted the fact that um, my wide angle lenses in particular weren't of a good enough quality yes. because the digital world is much more critical uh, in, in the computer. You can analyze your work so much closer than you can with film. Mm. So I had to upgrade some of the lenses, but whatever, I've stuck with, yeah. with Canon. Yes. And I'm not a technical person, as I've already said, and I've, I've just kept it simple, and I don't, yeah. I don't see any reason to, to change or keep on upgrading in, in many ways. Yes. But I'm basically saying that that all changed in the digital world, uh, and for the better. Uh, mm. The digital world's exciting, but it's very, very labor intensive. Mm. And all the work comes back to us as the photographers. In the past, you would send out transparencies mm. and the client would do all the work. Mm. That's all been reversed in the digital world. And it's, mm. But there's lots and lots of benefits. We don't lose pictures now. We don't get them scratched. We send, we send it out exactly as we want it printed. Yes. And that was the, that's a huge advantage for yes. a photographer. Um, we process it the way we do. Hopefully we don't over-process, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, because in the film world, clients didn't know the geography. They would print pictures backwards. They would mm -hmm. print well, even well-known pieces of landscape, Mount Everest, Patagonia landscapes, whatever. They would print them backwards because they, they, would, uh, they, would look, they wouldn't handle the emulsion correctly. They wouldn't know which side they were scanning. There was, and they would sometimes even print images upside down, believe it or not, if it was a, a reflection or yes. whatever. So that doesn't happen in the digital world. So there's lots and lots of advantages. Yes. What would you say to people who call post-processing cheating? Well, in, 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 I, I, in the photography workshops that I've done at Mount Cook, I call a, a raw file a little bit like a color negative or a black and white negative, that it's, that it's a start. Mm. But you, have to, you must process a raw picture to some degree. Mm. Uh, it must, it, you have yeah. to bring it to life. Uh, you, you're, in the back of the camera, you're seeing a JPEG, which is which is bright, and that's the colour that it should be that you've seen in the mm -hmm. landscape. But mm -hmm. the raw file is not like that, so you have to bring that raw file up to the same as as the JPEG and make them match. If you look at people that shot film or, or black and white, the, the famous people, if you look at their 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 test prints and things, there's there's dodging marks and and writing all over them. Those boys were manipulating images completely in the dark room. Uh, okay. uh, all of them were, all of them. So uh, it's, it's not a new thing. It's, uh, there's a famous book out there now called Faking It and it's, and it's all about fake pictures which were done right through the film era from the eight, late 1800s. Fascinating book, what they were able to achieve. Mm -hmm. Frank Hurley, the great Antarctic photographer, was criticised uh, in both world wars by his superior Australian officers for manipulating images, for putting in a shell burst here and a cloud here and a tank, broken tank here, and he put them all together. He did famously so with, with many of his images on Shackleton's expeditions. He was employed as a photojournalist to tell a story. Mm. That was his job. That's what Shackleton employed him for, to tell a story, and he damn well did, and did an amazing job of it. He was a, these guys were photojournalists. Mm. Uh, and so yes, they were, they were doing things in the darkroom. Mm. Uh, so I'm told you've been to Antarctica over a hundred times. Uh, you've been on 21 Himalayan expeditions, including epics to Everest and K2. You've traversed the North Pole, you've done a transit of the Northeastern Passage, you have dog sledded over Greenland, and then guided Shackleton's route over South Georgia. 
there must have been a few death defying moments in those trips can you are there any that stand out in your mind and can you tell us about them well, it's a pretty tough question Lynette it's um, uh, there certainly have been and there have been friends that have been killed on some expeditions so oh, wow. um, I've survived obviously so yes, yes. Uh, so yes there have been difficult moments mm. uh, but in terms of me personally then um, falling into the southern ocean is uh, is difficult uh, wow. it's, it's <laughs> uh, to say the least <laughs> I'm I'm largely a person of the mountains so and in the 10 years that I had with the New Zealand government uh, working out of Scott Base, working in the Transantarctic Mountains, we never saw the sea, it was always frozen. Yes. So when I went freelance as a photographer in 1983, I started working on adventure, for adventure cruise companies primarily, uh, which are dealing with the Southern Ocean. So my job was giving lectures on board and looking after people on shore, and eventually we started climbing mountains and crossing South Georgia, as you mentioned, but my main job was driving Zodiacs. Um, so uh, to learn to deal with the Southern Ocean, uh, in all its vagaries and difficulties uh, and be in charge of the safety of 10 passengers wow. is quite a responsibility. So the Southern Ocean is the most humbling creature on this planet. It's the biggest ocean in the world yes. and most powerful, affects the rest of the climate of the globe and yes. ocean currents, etc. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a place to fall into. It's, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, so dealing, with, dealing with, oh, I've fallen in several times oh. and uh, yeah, so yeah. anyway, dealing with the Southern Ocean has been a real privilege and uh, a, a real eye-opener in terms of looking after my own and other people's safety in mm. terms of guiding mm. for sure. Mm. So, but other death-defying moments, yes, we've, we went into the, uh, the crater of Erebus um, in 1978, um, an active volcano, and that was a very exciting science mission primarily and a, f a photographic mission as it turned out. And yes. uh, that could have gone either way when the volcano blew up twice when we were around, <laughs> very oh, close to it. Yeah. I, I was in charge of, of the dogs um, at oh, Scott Base okay. yeah. for all those years, and that led on to dog sledging across Greenland, which was yes. a fantastic expedition of skiing mm -hmm. with the dogs, three dog teams. And, yes. uh, yeah. But nothing de death defying there, it went yeah. routinely well. Uh, remarkable with two Norwegians, it was a fantastic expedition, but whatever, I have had difficult times in the Himalayas. Uh, mm -hmm. pro I've had four expeditions to Mongolia and four expeditions in Tibet, and one of them in Tibet uh, ended up primarily being a ski expedition uh, on a very big glacier, in fact the longest glacier in Tibet. Anyway, I've, to cut a long story short, I fell into a crevasse with skis on, fell, I don't know, 40 feet, uh, 45 feet or so, a long way. Mm -hmm and skis ripped off and I jammed and whatever. So that, that could have been Goodness. curtains for sure. Yes. Um, but um, I, thought my, I thought my pelvis was broken and I mm. thought my thumb was dislocated. Um, but my first job was I had to get my skis back. So when one ski ripped off and went down further, I had to get that back. And uh, anyway, I, I took some pictures when I was down there. It was interesting, looking up at my friend who was looking Goodness. down at me and he had the rope. So it's a long story on, yeah. on how one got out of that crevasse, but we eventually did. And, uh, so that was the closest, probably, where I could have, if I'd been severely injured, if my pelvis had been broken, then it would have taken the rest of the group um, seven or eight hours to get to me, and it could have been all over by then, so that, that was a close call, but we got out, my friend and I got out, and, yes, <laughs> and we yes. got, he got me out, yes, so it's yeah. A, yeah, yeah, kind of fascinating. Oh. Um, yes, but yeah. you've survived. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, indeed. And I no longer call myself a mountaineer at all, oh. it's, it's primarily uh, mountain travel, is what I enjoy, and because I passionately collect books on Asia or the polar regions, but um, I'm now uh, going to places, uh, and Mongolia is a good example. I went there many years ago as a result of an exhibition here in Canterbury Museum on Genghis Khan. Uh, so the three subsequent trips that I've done there were sparked by the earthquakes here in Christchurch mm -hmm. and the frustrations that that built where our house was badly damaged and the book library was packed away, the picture yeah. library was almost non-functional, staff ran away, whatever. Mm -hmm. I, in frustration, I, I sparked off three winter trips in Mongolia, which mm -hmm. were very exciting journeys. They weren't climbing trips at all. Uh, two of them with, were with camels, and the, this last one was just this year, uh, travelling in the Gobi Desert with camels, which was fantastic. Very cold, um, but very exciting. Uh, and, but the, the main one that I really, really enjoyed was even colder, and that was up in the north of Mongolia, travelling with reindeer. Um, and, and, I mean, this is, this, is the, this is the sort of country that we travelled through. I employed a Mongolian woman to be my interpreter and my cook, 
and we employed these two boys, father and son, and we had four riding reindeer and four baggage reindeer, and we travelled on a journey. It wasn't a journey done for me as a tourist. It was done as a journey they do every year in going up into the high country to bring down their herd of 1,200 reindeer yes. to the lowlands for the summer. Yes. So we spent uh, two weeks travelling here and building a teepee every night, digging away snow and cutting down poles and making a triangle, wrapping it with saddle blankets, and we had a little collapsible metal stove with us, chopped up firewood, crawled inside, warmed the tent up. and yes. So I mean photography was was very, very secondary on this journey, okay. but my job yeah. there was to document this journey. It was, yes. it was just a personal journey really and uh, yes. uh, it was just fantastic. So it was... Yeah. Uh, Fabulous. So your work's been featured in Time magazine and National Geographic. You've published eight photography books, is that correct? Yeah. Is there anything left on your bucket list? I think I've done about 12 books in total, and one of them was a guidebook on New Zealand for National Geographic. Right. Um, but yes, I've published images in their magazines mm. and, uh, and lots of their other books. Mm. Uh, one of the Italian books that I did, on, I've done five books on Antarctica, I think it is. Mm. And one of those books was published in Italy in about five languages, and mm. National Geographic published a 100,000 print run. So I have a philosophical question for you, Colin. <laughs> do you go to places to photograph them, or do you photograph the places you go to? I look at other images from other photographers that are actively doing workshops and stock photography in, in many ways and many of them seem to be on a set routine of locations, even those that come to New Zealand are on set routines and I've tried to be different. Yes, I like to go to some of those places as well, of course, uh, and I mean, excitingly I'm now going to places like Lake Matheson or whatever that I never photographed when I was a climber. So yes. beautiful places, of course I photograph them. But um, to answer your question, I, I've always thought about the journey first and the photography is purely documenting that journey. So in, okay. in raving on about Mongolia a few minutes ago, when I came out of that Genghis Khan exhibition here in the Canterbury Museum, I realised, because I collect books, I realised I had 10 or 12, 15 books on Mongolia. Mm. So I started reading about Mongolia mm. and I started thinking, that's got to be a place for a climb or for a journey. Mm. And now I've had four journeys there. And I would go back to Mongolia in a heartbeat for another journey that I have in mind with reindeer. So this, uh, it's the journey first and the photography is very much secondary. And I, and I think, the, the, to me, the journey creates um, unique individual images uh, instead of just going to a famous waterfall or a famous yeah. or whatever. I mean, I don't, it's not to put those photographers down or to put that mm. particular landscape down mm. at all, but to me the journey sparks off candid, unique photographs that are spur of the moment stuff often, that are people photographs or, or whatever, mm. that are the essence to me. And, and obviously people like Steve McCurry have been a, have been a hero and, okay. uh, and on one hand he doesn't hasn't done the, the journeys that I've done, mm. uh, a style of journey, he's, but he's still a photojournalist in, in many ways. And mm. he has set himself projects like his famous Monsoons book. Mm. And, and that was a 12 month plus uh, travelogue mm. through different countries photographing the monsoon. And uh, I really admire that sort of work. And he's, or he's gone to a particular location, even within a city like Calcutta or, or wherever, and he's waited and he's watched, he's been in a market and he's, he's interacted with the people. And I enjoy that aspect of, of mm. photography. I can't speak Tibetan, I can't speak Mongolian, mm. Mm. I can't speak Hindu, but I go to these places and I, I watch the, the, I use my hands mm. and my eyes and, uh, to interact with people mm. until they're comfortable with me um, b operating with a camera. Mm. And I'd like to think that, that in years to come I will graduate from having Canon 5D Mark IIs to having mirrorless cameras which are silent um, and they're also able to shoot motor drive very very quickly uh, but primarily silent so when I'm in people's homes or I'm in a, or I'm in a, a church, a temple, um, I'm not obtrusive with an SLR camera. Um, those mirrorless cameras are very high quality now, mm. they've got a lot going for them but I haven't got the courage yet to go out and, and instantly convert, but I, I, I like, this is why I say I like to think that I will graduate uh, 
mm. and there are other photographers that I admire mm. that have gone in that direction. Mm. Or in some cases, they, they're taking SLR cameras as well, but they're, mm. they're using mirrorless cameras. And I, that's, to me, that's, a, that's the way of the future yes. uh, for the type of journeys mm. that I want to do. Mm. I, can, I can leave the 5D Mark II at home and, and yes. concentrate, use that primarily for stitching panoramas, for argument's sake. So. Yes. Great, great. <laughs> well, would you like to show me some of your favourite photos? I can't show you any of those instantly, but and these are just ones that we've printed recently that, yes. that we eventually probably will frame because I do like them. And, and this is just an eagle hunter in, uh, in Mongolia riding his pony um, down a steep snow slope um, with the eagle coming into his gauntlet. And, uh, so that's, a, that's at least a 300mm lens shot. Yes. Um, uh, but I've, I've converted that, that's a colour color image in the camera, but I've converted it in this case yes. to a very slight sepia tone that I like. Um, but because I worked in Antarctica so much um, and my airfare was paid for me, mm. I would program in spending time in, in Patagonia uh, on the way home or the, or the way over there. So I've really enjoyed exploring the, the Chilean and, and indeed the Argentine mm. uh, Patagonia. So these are, these are just a couple of landscapes from... Beautiful from Fitzroy, from Los Glaciares mm. National Park, and uh, so I, I enjoy this sort of, mm. this sort of work. And, and these are digital, obviously, they're, they're right. new, they're new okay. pictures. And so that's just a couple, but... Uh. Right. Colin, it's been fantastic talking with you this morning. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time and just telling us so much about you and your work. It's been fabulous. If people are interested in looking at your work, um, is there a website for Hedgehog House? Sure. Uh, Sure. So www.hedgehoghouse.com. Hedgehoghouse, one word, dot com. Yep. Dot com. Yep. A lot of people can't spell hedgehog, so you've got to <laughs> practice, oh, really? practice your spelling of hedgehog first, but okay. never mind, you'll find it. Yeah. But I do have another website, which is really just a blog, and I haven't uh, activated it for, for quite a while, but there's about 60 pages on there on columnonteeth.com. So right. that, that has some little stories in there and, uh, yes. and images. Yes. and yeah. Uh, yeah. Fabulous. Thank, Thank you so much for taking time. time. My pleasure. Mm. Yeah. Good.